Well, I hope you're in Daniel chapter 4. And the title of our message this morning is King Nebuchadnezzar's Humbling. You know, there's no room for pride. There's no room for arrogance in light of who God is and the fact that he's sovereign and he's everywhere. And it took a while, but, but uh, who do you think is going to win in a contest between God and Nebuchadnezzar? Who do you think is going to win in a contest between you and God, you see? But what we have in Daniel chapter 4 is a picture of King Nebuchadnezzar's pride and his humbling by God because of that pride. And his humbling didn't just start in chapter 4, but it really began in chapter 1 when he recognized that Daniel and his companions, a couple of young kids really, uh, were 10 times better than his own wise men. And all of his attempts to bring wisdom to his kingdom, the three Hebrew, four Hebrew boys show up and they're wiser. It continued on into chapter 2 with the interpretation by Daniel of King Nebuchadnezzar's dream, which none of his own wise men could interpret. Then it was further advanced in chapter 3 when Daniel's three companions were delivered uh, by God from the fiery furnace that Nebuchadnezzar put them in. God was setting Nebuchadnezzar up bringing him to the place where he would not only acknowledge the God of Daniel, but that he would actually put his faith and trust in the God of Daniel, that, that the God of Daniel would become his God. The theme for the book of Daniel is the sovereignty of God. God is in control of everything. He's controlling the world, and he's preparing this world for his coming kingdom. God is sovereign. He's controlling the entire world, yet God has his eyes on a pagan king, and he's doing in King Nebuchadnezzar's life whatever is necessary to bring him to a place of faith and submission to himself. God's sovereign, yet he's interested in King Nebuchadnezzar, and he's interested in you and me. Isn't that amazing? Nothing is more important than our salvation than our recognition of who God is and our surrender to him and to his will, to his sovereignty, if you would. But this contest between God and King Nebuchadnezzar is an illustration, really, of God's dealings with the entire human race. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. They should come to salvation, and so he's working. And if you're already saved, you can think back to how God brought you to that place. And if you're not, then you can think about how God is bringing you to that place. But he will win. And you better surrender or you're going to be on the losing side. But in chapter 4, God is going to strive with King Nebuchadnezzar until he knows that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and he gives it to whoever he wills. God is sovereign. But back in chapter 2, you remember King Nebuchadnezzar learned that God is sovereign and that his kingdom, his kingdom of Babylon, by this great statue that he was given a dream of, it had an end. And maybe that's why King Nebuchadnezzar went to the trouble of building that golden image of himself in chapter 3 and why he spent from that moment the rest of his life in building Babylon and making it magnificent. Maybe he was trying by his own effort and his own pride to reverse the dream of chapter 2. But chapter 4 takes place about the 35th year of his rule, 30 years after the experience of chapter 3. You see, it took a while to humble this guy. But in verses 1 through 3, we have the decree, the king's decree, the official decree that King Nebuchadnezzar published and circulated after he was humbled by God. Look at what it says in the beginning in verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar, the king to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth. In other words, the whole realm of Babylon of which he was in charge. Peace be multiplied to you. I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the most high God has worked for me. How great are his signs and how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. So God's kingdom is not just overall in terms of geography, but also in terms of time and eternity. King Nebuchadnezzar's reign and the Babylonian kingdom had an end, yet God's reign and his kingdom will never end. 
But Nebuchadnezzar is here declaring to his kingdom that he had learned of God's power and his rule. He had learned that God is sovereign, and he learned through the mighty signs and wonders, specifically what had happened to him. And the same is true with us. King Nebuchadnezzar stands as a monument, really, to human pride. Pride is believing that you can handle everything yourself, that you don't need any help. Pride sees itself as better than others, smarter, more gifted than others. Aren't you glad that there's none of us that have that issue? <laughs> Paul wrote to the church in Corinth and said in 1 Corinthians 4, 7, who makes you to differ from another? And what do you have that you didn't receive? Now, if you indeed received it, then why do you glory as if you hadn't received it? Whatever we have, God has given to us, so there's no room for pride. And that was Nebuchadnezzar's problem. But verses 1 through 3 is a conclusion that King Nebuchadnezzar came to about God after his humbling, and the rest of the chapter is details about that actual humbling by God. He had previously, Nebuchadnezzar had previously acknowledged that, that God was the God of Daniel, that he was the God of all gods, but he was a little slow in coming to the actual accepting of Daniel's God as his own God. A lot of people are. A lot of us were. Now, if you're already saved, what did it take to bring you to that place? Do you remember back? And if you're not saved, the question is, what's it going to take for you to bow down and submit to God? In verses 4 through 18, we have his dream. And this is the second time that God had spoke to Nebuchadnezzar through a dream, and both of them frightened him. I, verse 4, Nebuchadnezzar was at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace. Everything was going well. And if you don't know that already, that's a sign that danger's ahead. A dangerous time for pride to set in when everything's going well. When things are going well, there's not a whole line, a lot of room for pride. Or when they're not going well, excuse me, there's not a lot of room for pride. But when God begins to prosper us or the work of our hands, that's when we need to be careful. But the city of Babylon, it was a wonderful place. It had a double wall all the way around it, 25 feet wide, 35 feet high. It was overlaid in blue stone with gold inlaid irons, uh, lions and dragons on it. You can imagine what it looked like. The main gate had 1,000-foot pavement leading up to it. There was a 288-foot high pyramid, a seven-story ziggurat, right in the middle of the city. His buildings are referred to as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, hanging gardens of Babylon. He had 17 temples in the city proper to his gods. It was called the city of gold. There was so much gold. But he was flourishing in his palace. And I thought it's interesting that word means to be grown, to green, uh, such as the growth of a green tree or leaves on a tree. So he's secure here in his accomplishments, proud of what he'd accomplished. I built this thing. I'm the king of the earth. Be careful when things are going well, when things are flourishing. And God is about to give him a dream of a tree, a green tree that God's going to cut down. Interesting that Nebuchadnezzar was also fascinated with trees. He loved trees so much that he visited Lebanon to see the cedars of Lebanon, the great cedars. No building in the ancient world was more beautiful or stronger than those built with the cedars of Lebanon. He was fascinated. But what he was fascinated with more than that was with himself. That's the problem. In an actual recorded prayer to one of his gods, Bel Marduk, he thanked God for giving him the supernatural strength in the presence of all of his soldiers to be able to actually tear down one of these cedars of Lebanon with his own hands. Can you imagine that? Isn't that weird that he would do that? But that's a recorded prayer. And I find it interesting that God would deal with him in a dream where he's the tree and God is literally tearing him down. Isn't that something? Showing him who's really in control. But he was at rest, he's flourishing, proud of his own efforts. And then in verse 5, I saw a dream which made me afraid. And the thoughts on my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. Therefore, I issued a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. 
And then the magicians and the astrologers and the Chaldeans and the soothsayers came in. And I told them the dream, but they could not make known to me the interpretation. And most of you are shaking your head. You're thinking, didn't he learn his lesson 35 years ago? Well, you know what keeps us from learning from the things we've gone through? It's our pride. They completely failed in their interpretation of the king's dream again. And so God demonstrates that only he can interpret dreams. That Nebuchadnezzar should have learned his lesson, but he didn't. But at last, Daniel came before me. His name is Belteshazzar. That was the name given to him by, by Nebuchadnezzar. It was a Babylonian name. According to the name of my God, in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. He, he's, he's, you know, some translations said the spirit of the holy gods. He recognized something about Daniel. I told the dream before him saying, Belteshazzar, chief of the magi uh, magicians. He still identifies him with the wise men of Babylon. It's like the world doesn't really know what to think about us believers, does it? They're not quite sure how to label us. Because I know that the spirit of the holy God is in you and no secret troubles you. Explain to me the visions of my dream that I have seen and its interpretation. These were the visions of my head while on my bed I was looking. Behold, a tree in the midst of the earth, and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong. Its height reached to the heavens, and it could be seen to all the ends of the earth. Its leaves were lovely, its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it. The fowls of the heaven dwelt in its branches, and all flesh was fed from it. I saw in the visions of my head while on my bed, and there was a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven, a messenger of some kind, uh, probably an angel. He cried aloud and said thus, chop down the tree and cut off its branches, strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the beast get out from under it, that is the tree, and the birds from its branches. Now you know why he was troubled. He's glorying in all of his, his accomplishments, his great kingdom pictured by this great tree, and a heavenly being comes along and says, chop it down. Nevertheless, leave the stump and roots in the earth bound with a band of iron and bronze. It's, it's the tender grass, or in the tender grass, excuse me, of the field. And so the tree's to be chopped down, but leave its stump, and then secure that stump with iron and brass or bronze bands. Now, the fact that the stump was left tells us that God would not wipe Nebuchadnezzar out completely, that there's still hope. You know, I don't know what's happened in your life, and maybe God has allowed something in your life that, that is difficult, 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 but he has a purpose. You know, most of us need to be knocked down a few notches. We think we're so you know, wonderful. But the stump in his story is a reminder that God's not through with us, that we can still get right with God, that he can still restore us if, it's, if we don't wait too long. And maybe God has cut us off. Maybe he's cut you off for a season like he's going to do with Nebuchadnezzar, but praise God, the stump is still there. There's still hope of restoration. It's like God says to Nebuchadnezzar, I'm going to knock you down, but not out. Aren't you glad that our God is a God of second chances? That he's not through with us? That today we can blow it and tomorrow he's still there to pick us up? It doesn't matter what's happened. God's able to use it for, for our good. Romans 8, 28, we, all, we, we know that all things work together for good to those who are called who love God, those that are called according to his purpose. God has a reason behind what he's allowed. There are not too many of us who at one time or another haven't needed a second chance from God. Now, I wish we could learn this lesson before the chopping has to take place. But thank God, even when it does, there's still a stump left. That's important. Let it that is, this stump, be wet with the dew of heaven and let him graze with the beasts of the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from that of a man and let him be given the, the heart of an animal and let seven times or seven years pass over him. So the decree of these watchers was that Nebuchadnezzar, who was represented by this great tree, would be chopped down and that all that would remain would, would be the stump. He would be given then the heart 
and mind of an animal. He would become like a beast in the field and live with the animals for seven seasons. Can you imagine that? Seven years. And you think, why would it take seven years? Man, if God did that to me, I certainly would get right right away. Well, think about how stubborn we are. Think about how prideful we are. Seven years before he looked up. Seven years. How long is it going to take for God to humble us? We're so stiff-necked. We're so stubborn. We're so prideful. We don't want anybody to know that we're hurting or that we're not right with God or that we haven't received Christ or whatever. We're so proud. You know, God's got a lot of time on his hands. Eternity. <laughs> we don't have that much. This decision is by the decree of the watchers, verse 17, and the sentence by the word of the holy ones. In order, here it is again, that the living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whoever he wills and sets over it the lowest of men. Don't get too proud, Nebuchadnezzar. You think you did all this? No, I put you there. I put you in that place. And you're nothing special. <laughs> well, what a great thing to learn. There's only one who's special, and that's God. And if we're special, it's because God's used us when he didn't have to. That's what's special, is that God is special. His father, a man named Nabopolazar, king of Babylon, the one who built the Babylonian kingdom really to begin with, his son, Nebuchadnezzar, just really enjoyed the fruits of what his father had done. In fact, his father was quoted as saying this, quote, my origin was so low, I was the son of nobody. I'm insignificant. He considered himself really one of the lowest of men, yet his son, Nebuchadnezzar, considered himself to be the greatest that ever lived. And God's going to show him who's really in charge. He was lifted up in pride, but he was about to be abased. Your father was the lowest, and I raised him in power. You inherited that. You didn't earn it. And because you didn't see that, that I raised him up, that I raised you up, I'm going to take you down. Wow. This is, this is so important that we understand this. There's no doubt that this dream was designed by God for the sole purpose of demonstrating his sovereignty, not only to Nebuchadnezzar, but to us. This dream, verse 18, I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now you, Belteshazzar, Daniel, declare its interpretation since all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known to me the interpretation, but you are able, for the spirit of the holy God is in you. He knew that Daniel could, could interpret it. It makes you wonder why he didn't call Daniel first. I think it was his pride. And now the dream's interpretation, beginning in verse 19. Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished for a time, and his thoughts troubled him. He knew what the dream meant, but he didn't want to tell Nebuchadnezzar. So the king spoke and said, Belteshazzar, do you let the dream or its interpretation, or do not let the dream or its interpretation trouble you? Belteshazzar answered and said, my lord, the dream concerned those who hate you, and its interpretation concerned your enemies. I wish it was for them, but it's not. I'm sorry. The tree that you saw, which grew and became strong, whose height reached unto the heavens, and which could be seen by all the earth whose leaves were lovely and its fruit abundant and which was food for all under which the beasts of the field dwelt and on whose branches the birds of the heavens had their habitation. It is you, O king. That's the same thing he said in his first dream. You're the head of gold. Who have grown and become strong for your greatness has grown and reaches to the heavens <clears throat> and your dominion to the end of the earth. And inasmuch as the king saw a watcher, a holy one coming down from heaven and saying, Chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave its stump and roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field. Let it be wet with the dew of heaven and let him graze with the beasts of the field till seven times pass over him. I wonder if we had this dream and we were given its interpretation, what that would do to us. You know, I think, you know, every time we read about pride and that pride goes before destruction and, and, and a haughty spirit before a fall, you know, it's a reminder to us to not continue in our pride. And so it's not like we haven't been reminded just because we haven't had dreams like this. 
In fact, I believe God's reminding us right now. And this is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord, the, the king. They, meaning these messengers, these holy ones, shall drive you from men. Your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make you eat grass like oxen. They shall wet you with the dew of heaven, and, and seven times shall pass over you, here it is again, till you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whoever he chooses. You didn't earn this. It isn't your great wisdom or knowledge. Don't, don't get prideful. And inasmuch as they gave the command to leave the stump and the roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be assured to you. It's going to be a temporary insanity after you come to know that heaven rules. Seven years it took for him to look up. You know, there's an actual disease called zoanthropy uh, where people actually be begin to think they're animals. Therefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by being righteous and, and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Perhaps there may be a lengthening of your prosperity. You know, you can stop this thing right now if you were to turn to God, if you were to repent, if you were to start doing what's right. Repent now before it's too late. And that's the thing the Lord, same thing the Lord says to every single one of us who's not right with him. Turn away from your sins and start doing what's right. What is going on in your life? What's going on in my life that if we don't stop doing that right now that we're going to have to pay for in the long run, you see? And the thing, just like Nebuchadnezzar, that kept him from doing what, what, what God told him that he needed to do was pride. Conviction is being awakened to a need, our need, and that's that, the need that we have, and that happens all the time, but repentance is acting upon that awakening and doing something about the sin. And it's pride, on the other hand, that keeps us from acting on the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Surely God wouldn't hold me accountable, you see. Now the fulfillment of this dream, beginning in verse 28. All of this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar at the end of the 12 months. So God gave him another 12 months, a year of grace, but please understand that grace has an end. He was walking about the royal palace of Babylon, and the king spoke, saying, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for, the royal, for a royal building by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? There's historical evidence that he had just finished the last of his great buildings in the city of Babylon 15 days before this. He's boasting in himself and his accomplishments. Two problems here. One, he said, I did it and was the reason he did it for his own majesty and honor. While the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you. And they, meaning the holy ones, shall drive you from men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen, and seven times shall pass over you, and here it is again, until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to wh whoever he chooses. That very hour, the word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men and ate grass like oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. You see, God never reaps judgment where he hasn't, first of all, sown knowledge. When men and women who are made in the likeness and image of God refuse to acknowledge God, then they're in grave danger of descending to the level of animals who are not made in the image and likeness of God. It was pride that transformed the angel Lucifer into Satan, a slithering snake. And it was pride that transformed the most glorious king of his day into an animal. And now the king's restoration. Thank God for verse 34 through 37. At the end of the time, the seven years, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven. He finally looked up. He finally looked up. I 
I read a bumper sticker the other day. It was a quote by uh, John Wayne. I loved it. It said, it says, life's hard, especially when you're stupid. <laughs> can, can we say that today? You know? But seven years. And, he, and he's looking at the ground. He's walking around, you know, looking at and eating grass before he finally looked up. You know what the antidote for our pride is? Quit looking at yourself and start looking at God. It's that simple. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you. He lifted up his eyes to heaven. That's where it starts. When are you and I going to look up to God? When are we going to, what are we going to have to go through until we do? And then notice, and my understanding returned to me. Now he's getting it. His understanding before this was blurred by his own self-importance, by his pride. And now praise comes. And I bless the Most High and praise him and honored him who lives forever for his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom is from generation to generation. He finally recognizes the sovereignty of God. He realized who, in fact, was in charge. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to the will in his army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. Not only in heaven, but on earth as well. No one can constrain his hand and say to him, what have you done? At the same time, my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and splendor returned to me. Remember the band? God said, you know, the stump is still there, and the band is going to secure that. This is almost unheard of. For seven years, he was out in the field, eating grass, and he came back, and his senses came back to him once he looked up to God, and everything was as it was before that. Once we repent and quit looking at ourselves, once we prove it by praising God and honoring God for once and we serve him, then God moves in and he restores and he blesses, you see. My counselors and nobles resorted to me and I was restored or to my kingdom and excellent majesty was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all of whose works are truth and his ways justice. God will do whatever it takes. And the last part of this chapter, I believe, is for our admonition. And those who walk in pride, he's able to abase. Most Bible commentators believe this is an actual true conversion, that this is that Nebuchadnezzar, we will see him in heaven. He actually got saved here recognized God. But it's true, it's sad, but it's true that often God has to hurt us before he can heal us. We're so proud. We're so stubborn. It's our pride that gets in the way with what God wants to do with us. Wouldn't it have been better to recognize the sovereignty of God now and not have to go through what this king had to go through? And what is it that's keeping us from acknowledging that God's in charge? When we have a little bit of success, we start thinking we're God's gift, you know, to the world or something. What's wrong with us? It's our pride that keeps us from recognizing the solution to our problem. And as long as we're proud, we're never going to experience the blessing that God wants to put upon our lives because we'll think that we did it. And if we do that, then we're going down the tubes just like Satan did. But if we repent and look up, realizing that God's sovereign, that every time we, we, we experience a blessing that we thank God, we recognize that it's God. The good news is, for us, is that the stump is still there. <laughs> There's still the possibility. God's not through with us. I like what the Apostle Paul said, God forbid that I should glory in anything except the cross of Christ. That's it. There's also a prophetic significance to this chapter as well. Even though God has allowed the nations a place of prominence in this world like we're seeing today, 
Yet like Nebuchadnezzar, the majority of the nations walk around in pride and they neglect God, and God is going to bring it all to a, an end. We've been reading about that. The other thing you have to recognize here is just that this is all set up in the, in the way that this is all written, chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4, and then chapter 5 we're going to look at next week is the downfall of the Babylonian Empire. God is setting up our world to deal with them. And it's hard to watch, isn't it? It's, it's hard to believe that God would actually cut off a world leader like that and humble him in order to save him. But our God is committed. There, he's got a plan. He's going to bring his kingdom on this earth, and, and nobody's going to keep that from happening. And in the midst of that, he's humbling world leaders. And he's humbling nations and he's working with individuals. Our God is amazing. Revelation eleven fifteen 15 says, Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. It's coming. It, it, it's, it's happening. In fact, like we read in, in Daniel chapter 4, there's not anything going to keep God from doing what he wants to do. It's going to happen. And I, for one, am looking forward to the kingdom of God. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for a reminder about pride and how that can keep a person from you, from knowing you, Lord from submitting to you and from even being saved. And Lord, you know who it is this morning that's in that place that, that have never really looked up to you and humbled themselves. They've, they've been more worried about what somebody else thinks or, or more worried about what they might have to let go of if they turn and look up to you, Lord. God, would you work in their hearts? Would you bring them to that place, Lord? You're so loving and patient, towards those who are rebellious, Lord. Lord, thank you that you're working in those that we know and love to bring them to that place, Lord. And Lord, thank you for the work that you did in us, breaking us of our pride and our, our, our stubbornness, Lord. And thank you, God, for saving us. Thank you, Lord, for restoring us to your original intention, that we might have fellowship with you, that we might spend eternity with you, God. Lord, we thank you again for the book of Daniel and the, and the lessons that are here. Lord, we lift up our world to you. We recognize as we look around the world that, that kingdoms are rising, that kingdoms are falling, that, that people are being taken out of power, other people are being put in power, that we have an election in this country that's coming up and all of us have opinions but you're going to do absolutely what it is that you're going to do. And you know why. And, and we may never know, except that you're doing your will and that you want people to repent and come to Christ. Lord, thank you that you leave the stump. Thank you, God, that there's always a second chance. Help us to take that chance before it's too late, Lord. Help us to look up to you, to Jesus Christ, the one who died for us, for our sins, that we might come to God. We ask these things, Lord. We thank you for them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand. If, if you are here this morning and, and maybe you're going, uh, gosh, um, I've never really humbled myself and, 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 and admitted my need for Christ. I've never really done that. Well, today may be your day. Please go tell somebody that, I, that I, I need to repent of my sins. I need to come to Christ. We always have those on either side after the service that can pray with you. But you could literally go to anybody that you know as a believer and tell them, would you pray for me? I need to take a step back and look up to God. I, I'm going down the tubes apart from that. In fact, every one of us has done that or, or we're not saved. And if you haven't, please take that opportunity today.